Hello, my name is Bill Dixon. Welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam. Uh, tonight, uh, you've got me by myself. My normal co-host, uh, Mr. Bob Matthews, uh, has taken his uh, beautiful bride to Hawaii for their 50th anniversary. Uh, they're repeating R&R. Uh, &R. They met each other in uh, Hawaii for R&R, &R, so they're going back for their uh, 5th anniversary to uh, replay their R&R. &R. I hope right now they're having a good time uh, in, the, in the islands and uh, that we're going to go see some islands they didn't get a chance to see before. Uh, again, I want to start out the show by apologizing. Uh, unfortunately, I have no control over what's going on. I had promised you several times now we'd have the, uh, the women who served uh, symposium that we did at the uh, museum. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're a victim of some uh, politics going on, but at the same time, they tell me that the machine is broken down where they make copies and they couldn't make copies. And there was a chance I was going to get it today, but obviously I didn't get it because here I am apologizing to you. Uh, we'll try to have an interesting show uh, tonight in, in spite of it. It was a show we had um, planned for some time. I was just hoping for my uh, co-host to be with me. Uh, I think this is going to be a two-parter, and the most important part for, will be the next time when he's here. But I wanted to go over a couple things that are going on in the veterans world in this area. Um, I have to look at my notes here. Um, September 25th, uh, again at the North Carolina Museum of History, Daniels Auditorium, uh, right there on Eden Street, we'll be doing uh, Vietnam, the Black Experience, uh, where we will have um, uh, black soldiers come in and be on the panel to talk about uh, things before going to Vietnam, uh, what it was like to be in Vietnam, and what it was like uh, coming home for uh, the black soldier uh, in Vietnam. Vietnam was the uh, first war, uh, really, that the uh, black soldier was totally involved, uh, pretty much in Korea, but it was even more so uh, in Vietnam. There's a lot of myths, mistruths out there, just like there was in everything else. We're trying to uh, have an opportunity to, for them to tell their story and their side of uh, history and so we can't straighten out some of the history rewriters and so forth. But that's uh, September the 25th from 7 to 9 o'clock at the North Carolina History Museum. Uh, also, the 18th of September uh, is National POW Recognition Day. Uh, if you're in the Raleigh area, well, uh, there will be a ceremony at 6 o'clock at the Capitol. If you're in the Durham area, there's going to be a uh, stand down where they have uh, different veterans or, uh, groups or support groups come in and help uh, homeless veterans, but it's for any veteran to go by uh, for lunch. They're also going to be dedicating a POW MIA chair there at the old uh, Durham Athletic Park, uh, a ceremony about 8 o'clock in the morning, I believe. The um, October 3rd will be the uh, normally monthly uh, POW MIA ceremony at the Raleigh State Capitol. And another really important event for you to put on your calendar is 15th through the 19th of October, the Almire Post or the Order of the Purple Hearts Chapter 637 will have the wall that heals, what we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, there in Henderson. Now, the location is the East Coast Drag Time Hall, uh, Hall of Fame. I have no earthy idea where that is right at the moment, but I believe if you get to Henderson, North Carolina, and say I'm looking for the East Coast Drag Times Hall of Fame, somebody there is going to be able to tell you how to get there, or we'll try to have some information about it, uh, the actual location and so forth. And then we'll have, uh, after that, October 28th, we'll have our Lessons of uh, Vietnam show, and hopefully by then we'll have the... Uh, copy of the uh, symposium of the uh, women who served. And then November 7th is the uh, Wake County or North Carolina Veterans Day Parade. It's also our normally monthly POW MIA ceremony. Uh, in the 10th of November, there'll be another symposium uh, at the North Carolina History Museum. November 11th is Veterans Day. Uh, most of the events that are going on here in Raleigh will be before Veterans Day with the parade and so forth, but there will be other events going on. 
Uh, so those are some of the things going on. And also put on your calendar, the 20th of December, we'll be doing our uh, annual Christmas uh, lighting uh, luminaries and so forth at the memorial. That'll be at 6 o'clock. Now, uh, tonight when you are, we're going to go through uh, our show tonight is uh, the Vietnam Memorial Wall and the things they left. But I thought it was important to go along with the things that they leave at the wall is how the wall got there. So tonight we're going to be talking a lot about how how they got the wall there, what they all went went through. Uh, when you get through listening to their story, you realize that it's um, hard to believe they even got the wall built. Uh, in the length of time they uh, did uh, the whole thing, it was about three years or so. And to getting a memorial built at the Capitol is a challenge to itself. I understand now there will not be another memorial of any kind built on the National Mall for another 50 years because of politics and so forth. So I want to get started uh, with our PowerPoint presentation to uh, go through it and tell you a little bit about the wall, how it got there and so forth. Our first slide, wanted, I wanted to start out with uh, some of the things left at the wall. This is a book that Robert McNamara wrote and the gentleman wanted to show how much he enjoyed the book. I'm going to read the writings on it, the tape. It says, wounded nine times by enemy fire, and the lessons was about our leadership. The tragedy was their cowardice. Ninth Air Cav. And if you'll see on there, he's got each bullet hole labeled where he shot it nine times. Excellent book, worth nine bullets. Have a nice life. We fought for it. Thanks for nothing. 1970-71, Headhunter 16. Now you kind of get the idea that um, he was not too happy about uh, McNamara's book. If you hadn't read it, uh, you ought to get it and read it uh, and see how he backtracks and, and makes excuses and other things as politicians has to do. But... Um, as we go through tonight, I want you to call in and ask questions, be part of it, make a comment, uh, suggestion, whatever you'd like. Uh, just call us at 919-518-9773, or even better, go to Q Computers, I know I can say that word, Computers 2K Voice, and that's on Skype, and come in and be part of the show. Now, the Vietnam War Memorial, when it was first being uh, come out with, the design first came out with, it was called Everything in the World but besides a memorial. It was called the Black Gash of Shame. Uh, the wall itself had was as much conflict and uh, nation divided as, as a war. Uh, and sometimes it seems like it might even be more. But... Um, there was a man by the name of uh, Jan Scruggs. He is a Vietnam veteran, uh, infantry, was wounded in Vietnam. And he went to see the movie, The Deer Hunter. Now, The Deer Hunter had all kinds of uh, present day stars. I, I found The Deer Hunter, when I went to see it, one of the most depressing movies I've ever seen. But he watched the movie and it brought back a lot of memories. And when he came home that night, he couldn't sleep tossing around in bed, and he finally got up and uh, went and had him a few adult uh, beverages and sit around and thought, and the, f the faces that of his buddies who had died in Vietnam and those that he served with kept coming up in front of him. He just couldn't get away from their faces. Next morning when his wife got up, he said, never remembers their names. I'm going to build a memorial to the guys who served. It will have the names of everyone who ki was killed. Now, his wife thought he was a nice guy, I guess, because she was married to him, but she also thought he was crazy. Uh, building, him building a memorial, he didn't know anything about building memorials. He didn't know anything about raising money. He didn't know anything about working with the politics. But he thought it was such a great idea that people would be just knocking him down to come over and say, let me be part, let me be part, and just no problem whatsoever. But then the cold reality hit him, and he realized that, uh, well, everybody thought he was crazy, thought he was naive, 
thought he didn't know what he was doing, and truthfully, he didn't know what he was doing, which is probably why he got the wall built. Uh, he put together an organization and started raising funds, and uh, there was an article about him on uh, on the news that reported how how well he was doing with this Vietnam Memorial, and he had raised one hundred and forty four dollars and fifty cents. That was his total amount had raised. But as the word was getting out, a another attorney, Vietnam veteran, by the name of Bob Dubeck, a former Air Force officer uh, who served in Da Nang in 1969, he had a dream also of, of doing something. And he decided, uh, he got up with Jan, and they talked about it, and they decided they needed to start a nonprofit organization. And another Vietnam veteran and attorney saw the report of the fundraising of a grand total of $144.50, and he decided he would, uh, he'd like to get involved, and he called Jan himself. His name was Jack Wheeler. Now, you may remember Jack Wheeler's name uh, for over some of these others. Uh, Jack Wheeler was found a couple of years ago murdered. Uh, his body was found in a uh, trash dump somewhere in the D.C. area. I don't think it had anything to do with the wall, but it was just a little thing I was going to throw in uh, about Jack, uh, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, but the three of them uh, getting together was a godsend. Uh, they knew a little bit about uh, with, with politics and so forth, uh, what to do with that part, and Jan came along with ideas and audacity and just plain old stubborn, we're going to get it done. Uh, the newly incorporated uh, nonprofit uh, decided that next thing they needed to do was get the politicians involved. So they went and talked to uh, their um, uh, congressman or senator, and his name was Charles uh, Mathias. Mathias himself was always an opponent of the Vietnam War, didn't want to have anything to do with it and so forth. But uh, Jan sat down and explained to him that. Uh, he didn't want to glorify war in any way. He didn't want any money from the government. They would raise their own money. What he wanted was a commitment from the government to give them a piece of land to put this memorial on. And Matthias got to thinking that, you know, this is not such a bad idea after all. And he decided to come on board and help. Well, as anything in Washington, uh, if you're looking at politics lately, not a whole lot of things gets done uh, because of the bureaucracy and uh, uh, polit uh, politics and uh, different parties trying to outdo each other and so forth, plus the different committees, the uh, uh, mall committee, the historic committee, the arts committee, all these committees and so forth who have to sign off on such and like. And Matthias took a, took a real chance. He bypassed all these committees and, and bureaucratic groups uh, and went straight to Congress and told Congress what he wanted to do. And lo and behold, Congress was all got in behind it and said they were all for it, which uh, was great because if it hadn't, they had to go back to t these people that had stepped on all these toes and so forth to start all over again would have been a nightmare. So they got a piece of land promised was right where they wanted to be, right at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial, which is where the wall is now, if you've been over there. So now they've got the commitment of location of the wall, not the exact location, but a location for the wall. Now it came down to the uh, nitty gritty, it's called the money. Where is the money? Now raising money, if you've never tried it before, without some money to work with is, uh, well, it's just kind of crazy to do. It's hard to raise money if you don't have any money because you got to spend some money to get money they come up with the great idea, let's do a mass mailing. Well, the only problem is, who's gonna pay for the paper, the envelope, the stamps, and the time it takes to get these things ready? So they had that overcome, but um, Texas billionaire Ross Perot, uh, who was always a veteran supporter, uh, got wind of what they wanted to do, and he donated $10,000 to pay for the mailings and they sent out the mailings, and the mailings all came in when everything was said and done, they made $6,500. Not a whole lot of money, but it was a start. Plus also it got the word out to the people of America that somebody wanted to build a memorial to the Vietnam veteran. 
Now, when the word got out, people started writing in letters and of, uh, of approval and disapproval, and money started coming in and so forth. Pretty good response right off to start with. But some of the letters were good and some of the letters were bad. I'm going to read some of the letters that you've got there. Uh, thank you for remembering. Memorial is a stupid thing when so many of the surviving veterans are so sick and suffering with no place to turn, which was true. There was uh, definitely uh, a need for support of the Vietnam veteran. He didn't die there. He just died inside. And there's a, there's a uh, poster out that, uh, when, were you last, when were you last in Vietnam? I was there last night. Uh, and there's another one that says that uh, everybody who died in Vietnam didn't die in country. Uh, a lot of men came home, uh, were having all the problems of the Vietnam War and their life, and just kind of generally messed up their entire life and uh, lost their families, uh, uh, alcoholics, everything you can think of. Uh, even though they didn't lose their life in Vietnam, their life was basically over with. And <clears throat> I hope your memorial can heal many of the hurts that that unfortunate war has caused. It lies there like unfinished business. See, the memorial was started uh, not too long after the fall of Saigon. Most memorials take years and years and years after the event has happened for it to uh, be built. But Vietnam was fresh in the mind of so many people and it was an unfinished business because uh, the way press and people coming out as the first war we lost, Vietnam veterans were not allowed to join so many of the national organizations because they didn't think that they were real veterans because they had lost the war. This is one I like. For I, for one, am getting very tired of hearing about the poor Vietnam veteran. To me, you're a bunch of crybabies. Well, you wouldn't let us join. You didn't want us. We couldn't get our, our problems taken care of. Post-traumatic stress didn't, didn't exist as far as a, 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 a treatable, uh, not only from the Vietnam War. Agent Orange problems didn't exist. Uh, all the things that have now come out about the Vietnam War and the veterans who fought there uh, were not out. So you did have uh, a lot of people out there complaining about uh, the Vietnam veteran and, and getting some recognition and so forth. Another one was, he was my only grandson and they made a donation. And another from a Vietnam veteran, don't build us a memorial. Instead, every year invite each of us to a classroom to discuss what it was like. And Vietnam, North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated took that on uh, for years, about since they were first started in 1987 was to go into schools and education and today we're still very involved in education and taking care of the myths is why we go into schools why we have about 1200 uh, courses uh, nationwide why we do the symposiums to uh, educate the people on what Vietnam was about maybe stop another Vietnam as well as uh, keeping out there the American, that freedom is not free, somebody has to pay for it. A lot of the old anti-war groups started coming out and were opposing. And one of the most audacious things to me was they wanted along with the wall of, with the names of the uh, people who, men and women who died in Vietnam, they wanted to have put on the wall the names of the people who went to jail protesting the war. Now that had been quite a memorial. Uh, but that was um, one of the many things that was fighting. And then, of course, politics in Washington, bureaucracies, they had, each one of them had their own ideas what a memorial look, would look at. Uh, even though they had a location for it, they, nobody had an idea what was a memorial going to look at. Just what is this memorial? So while they were still raising money, they were still fighting uh, the uh, war of what, what the memorial was going to look at and so forth, well, while they were raising money, uh, a lot of notable architects and so forth and sculptors came out. And they were, uh, one of them was by a man by the name of Frederick Hart. 
he was actually at war protested during the war, but he wanted to be part of the memorial. He was a sculpture. And they looked at his design and rejected it and decided they were going to go with a national competition. Let's let the people in the nation to decide what the memorial was going to look like. Now, one of the reasons they were doing that because they knew to have the veterans approve the uh, design, whatever it was, that to have the politicians to approve it, the art communities to approve it, and everybody else to approve it, it had to be uh, done in such a way that there was no one side uh, favored over the other. So they started to come up with a um, committee to put up, put together the design requirements and on top of that, it ended up with more confusion and arguments and, and controversy on who was going to be the jury, who was going to be the committee of people who decided what the design should be to approve the design and so forth. And first of all, that one group wanted the Vietnam veterans and the, and the Gold Star Mothers to get together and come up with what they thought the memorial was going to be. And another group wanted the professional people, the artsy people, to come together and decide what the memorial should be. And back and forth, a lot of screaming and so forth. But finally they got together and decided there would be a professional group, but the professional group would each one be totally screened, uh, questioned and so forth to make sure that they understood what the veteran uh, felt about the memorial and they were not anti-Vietnam War. Uh, that was the criteria for the judges. They selected a jury and so forth. So now they have got a jury. What are they going to do as far as the competition? Well, they're still raising money now, uh, but they found out that they're going to have to raise more money. Originally, they were going to start out raising $2.5 million, and now they realize they're going to have to up that to something like two point seven to $10 million uh, as things kept progressing. So now we're time for the competition. That in itself was uh, quite interesting. The, um, <clears throat> again, the situation came up, money. Seems like money keeps rearing its head. Between money and politics, uh, it's one of the memorial ever got done. Uh, Ross Perot then again stepped up and said, okay, I'll underwrite the competition for the design. He gave them $160,000 to help pay for the uh, information and all the things that need to be done to get the design out. Now, you think about it. Here's an opportunity for a $20 entry fee that you could win $20,000, have something that you came up with to be on the National Mall forever. I mean, it was absolutely uh, a wonderful opportunity for someone who wanted to keep their name out there, who was uh, wanted to uh, have the exposure as far as advertisement and so forth. The only real criteria was that you had to be an American citizen and to that they, they wanted the names and so forth. Well, it was also important when they come along was that everything was anonymous. All the designs came in had to be totally anonymous. So the designer, whoever came up with their design, had to put a envelope with the design with their name and information inside. So as the designs were coming in, each one was cataloged, given a number, and put in a warehouse. Now, by the time the deadline got there, they had 1,400 and some entries. Can you imagine 1,400 entrances for this one competition? That alone is mind-boggling to me if I've been as a jury having to sit together and come up with unanimous decision on anything, let alone going through 1,400 and some uh, entries. What they did was they uh, put together all the entries, entries into an aircraft hangar big enough to spread them all out. And they spent a week going through, picking out the ones they like. And one particular kept coming up that each one of them liked. 
They kept willing down, throwing away the ones that was not, they were just wasn't quite there. But it all came down to all of them finally come together with, they didn't quite understand why, they didn't quite understand the concept, but it was something hauntingly about entrant, entry number 1026. So they decided unanimously that was going to be the entrant the design they were going to take. This, this entry was going to be the memorial for the Vietnam veterans. Now, they tried, they couldn't, they, even though they chose the entry, they could not explain the entry themselves. In five or 10 minutes, they just sit down and, and just, each one of them, I, I saw something different. So they're trying to, now they've got to explain this to the American public, to the politicians, to the money people, to get this thing done. And that got to be a real chore into itself. That created about as much as opposition as anything. They had to sell the design to the American public. Well, it was time to tell the person who designed they had chosen. So the some of the committee members got on a plane and flew to Yale University. The designer winner was a young undergraduate student by the name of Maya Lin, and she was an amateur. She was Oriental, which later created some problems. But she had actually designed the design for the memorial as a class project. And to come to find out, she'd only got a B on the project. Well, normally she got A's all the way through the project. She only got a B. But they met with her and talked to her about the, her, the design and so forth. Then they finally got around to telling her that she had won. And they tried, and they tried to explain to her just how much controversy she was going to uh, uh, be facing uh, getting the memorial proposed. She skipped her finals uh, and uh, went back to Washington to meet with the press and so forth. But even before the press saw the um, memorial design, Ross Perot got in touch with Jan Scruggs and says, I want to know about the design that you picked. You picked the design. I got a lot of money involved. I want to see the design. Now, they didn't want anybody to see it before the announcement, but when Ross Perot says, I want to see it, Jan Scruggs relented and showed Ross Perot the memorial concept. Boy, did it hit the fan then. A firestorm of protest came along. Ross Perot said it was the worst-looking thing he had ever seen. The design was called the body count on the mall. As you remember how we could tell whether winning and losing in Vietnam was the body count of the enemy? Well, they used that as also the body count on the wall, a wounded mother or earth. It stirred such strong emotions that people either loved it or liked it. And it seems like the ones who liked it liked it uh, a little bit, and the ones who didn't like it were very vocal. Uh, so some of the ones who, didn't who did like it started to uh, coming in with more money and so forth. Uh, making money, raising money a little bit easier. But those who didn't like it, they were not qu uh, quiet about it at all. And the press just kind of really enjoyed it. Along with that, as they were processing going through, they came up upon a new problem. Ma Lin was born in 1959. That was the year the first person uh, or military man was recorded to have died in Vietnam. Now, here was a young lady who was non-political, didn't know anything about the war. She was Asian, which didn't help the fact that she would design a uh, Vietnam memorial because a lot of Vietnam veterans had a bad outlook on all Asians, especially Vietnamese, uh, and when she happens to be Chinese. But um, the old guys, or I'll say old guys, but the veterans and so forth on the committee uh, had a concept of what the, she, they wanted, and she had a concept of what she wanted and she kept referring back to uh, how it gave her the feeling of death, and that was the thing they wanted to stay away from, even though they wanted names on there. They wanted to be a memorial to all Vietnam veterans and just not to the ones who died. 
So then they started coming out with new uh, sayings about it. The black gash of shame. The moral is below ground, denoting shame. There is no flag. This honors, this dishonors those who died fighting for that flag, which kept coming up from time to time about the flag. It's black, a color of shame. It forms anti-war V peace sign. I remember hearing that one. It's a tombstone. Only, only those who died. It's unheroic. And it was a lot more, which we can't say or wouldn't want to say out in public and so forth. But uh, it seems that the news really like to uh, go to these people who are opposing and get their part of it, but weren't too interested in getting uh, uh, the views of people who were before it and, and so forth. So it really looked like the whole idea of the memorial was just crumbling uh, to being knocked down uh, by Washington and politics and so forth. There was a very strong political group who got together who kind of wanted to use the wall and the memorial to uh, talk about why we shouldn't be in the war and so forth. Uh, there was meetings. Uh, there was a meeting set up, by, uh, a congressional meeting set up, and it seems that Ross Perot had gotten the opponents of the wall all put together, and they kind of ambushed uh, Jan Scruggs and his committee uh, when they had a meeting. The meeting was very cantankerous, a lot of screaming and hollering and beating on the table. But during the meeting, General George Price, one of the nation's highest ranking officers, uh, General Price got up and said, I remind you all, excuse me, I remind you of all of Martin Luther King, who fought for justice for all Americans. Black is not a color of shame. I am tired of hearing it called such by you. Color meant nothing on the battlefields of Korea or Vietnam. We are equal in combat. Color should not mean nothing now. And after her general got up and uh, made those comments, uh, the opposition to the wall being black uh, ended right there. There was just there was no way they could come back in and say anything about it. Uh, they meeting was going on into early evening. Everybody was tired. Nobody was taking a break. And then General Mike Davidson uh, stood up and said, wait a minute, let's have a compromise. Let's have the wall just like it was designed. Some people call it the bat, the way it looked. But let's have a statue and a flag. And the opposition got together and decided that's a good idea. Let's do that. So they had a voice vote, and everybody decided that's what they wanted, and they'd get back together for another meeting to discuss the statue itself. Well, even though they had gotten uh, kind of somewhat agreed and so forth to building the memorial, as, as uh, my land had somewhat designed it, uh, but they wanted aspects of that done. Uh, they wanted some inscription on it, and she did not want it on there. Uh, the word Vietnam was not on there. Uh, they objected to that. So the war was not over by any means. So they got together with their second meeting. Now, while they were doing that, the Moore Committee was pushing hard to get a building permit because they felt like if they had a building permit, it was going to be harder for uh, the politicians or anybody else to stop the building of memorial. To them, the pivoting point of the whole process was get a building permit, but the building permit process was held up by the controversy of the wall and the statue and the flag. Well, when they got their second meeting, Ross Perot was there with the strong opposition again. And then they kind of got together and talked about, well, none of them even knew what the memorial was going to look like to a certain extent, or, or specifically where it was going to go. They were supposed to discuss exactly where it was going to go, but it was thrown out. Uh, that discussion and the discussion was totally on, on the statue and the flag and the location. Well, to make the long story short, they decided to put the flag in the middle or the apex of the wall, totally against what uh, Ma Lin was looking for. Uh, she wanted the simplicity of it. And then in the triangle, and the valley, the triangle created by the two Vs was going to put the statue. So then they agreed to do that. 
even though that's not what uh, my land and uh, the committee wanted, but in order to get it done, they agreed to that. Finally, on March 15th, while all this other stuff was going on, uh, Dubeck was able to get James Watt to issue the permit. They finally had that permit. It meant time now to get the granite and the site ready. So they met with the contractors out on the site, and they said, okay, have you ever seen a place after a big bombing run? how tore up it is. And the contractor happened to be a Vietnam vet. He said, yes. He says, that's what I want. I want you to tear up as much ground and land as you can possibly do so it's going to be so bad that there's no way they're going to come back and stop the project. He said, I can do that. So while he was out there just tearing up the land and so forth, get it started on that part, they started getting the uh, granite ready. Now, the American granite uh, would not work because the American granite has veins of gray all through it. It didn't have that mirror finish that uh, the black granite was. So they located some uh, granite uh, the way they wanted the black granite in uh, a quarry right outside of Bangor, Maine. That uh, granite had to be quarried by hand. So the Indian quarries by hand quarried 3,000 cubic feet of granite. Now, each cubic foot of granite weighed 210 pounds, and it was all handled by hand. So you know just that in itself. So then it has to be shipped to the United States to a uh, facility in Vermont where the granite panels were uh, cut in uh, proper size. They were to be anything from 10 feet 8 inches to 8 inches by 40 inches, 3 inches thick. They used uh, a diamond cutters to cut these panels. Then they had to polish them uh, to mirror finish. And after that, they had to ship them to Tennessee, to uh, Memphis, to the Benzwanger glass facility for sandblasting and so forth. Now, that was a new problem. They wanted to get the pa some panels there as soon as possible. But at the same time, you just can't put these granite panels on any truck and flat bag and deliver them because if one of them broke, they had a real problem because they weren't sure how much granite was left to replace it, the panels, the 150 panels that were needed. Uh, there's not a whole lot of granite. I mean, when granite is made by nature, it takes a couple of years to do it. So they were scared of that. So they had to find some special trucks with cushioning in them to deliver it there. Now they got the panels there. How about the names? If you try to put together all the government information about the casualties of the Vietnam War from all the different sources, that itself had to be a daunting task because when were they killed was important as long as their full name. But they did a great job. There's only a few mistakes on the wall. I think there's about 12 or so on the wall that are actually still alive. But overall, they did a great job. Uh, I think it was one or two misspellings, but did a great job of getting the names and so forth. So now we're starting on the, on the wall. Meantime, meanwhile, excuse me, um, they got together, the statue committee got together and decided now we need to figure out what we're going to do on the statue. Along came Frederick Hart again. And he said he would still like to be part of it. So they named him as the... Um, sculpture of the statue. Now, the, what they wanted the statue to be was uh, a statue of showing uh, the combat soldier and the comradeship they had and so forth. It was very important. They started out with uh, one figure and then they said, no, that's not enough. So they put together the three. Uh, so he came up with the statue of the three soldiers. It was approved. But then another problem came up. With all these other problems, raising its head. There was one that had been in the background all along. Maya Lynn was not too happy about having her design, as any designer would be, uh, come back in and a committee getting together and making all these changes. She wanted it as simple as possible. Plus, she didn't like the idea of the statue or the, or the flag being at her, at her design. Uh, it, plus, she had her feelings hurt by the committee because they kept saying that's okay because uh, the committee had the final say. 
So she came out all of a sudden on the when the design was, for the three soldiers were came out was she came out all of a sudden and said, "Okay, wait a minute, you screwed up my design. What right does Frederick Hart have coming in and messing up my design?" What man has integrity to come in and draw a mustache on somebody else's design, a memorial? Because one of the three soldiers had a mustache. She did not uh, 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 quince any words whatsoever when it comes to talking about what she fret, uh, thought of Frederick Hart. She brought out the fact that he was originally uh, one of the designers who uh, was objected but he was finding a back way to get in on the design and get his name out on the wall. And on top of all this, Ross Perot got upset, was mad. Uh, he didn't like the design to start with. Now she's coming out talking about the design and so forth. And he was started talking about suing and everything else. So all the different problems started coming through. It seemed like everyone had their own agenda, and most of them's agenda, except for the committee, was to delay the project. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund was scared that Ma Lin, after she hired an attorney, would put an uh, injunction on the, on the project and delay it indefinitely over, for years and years. James Webb wanted to keep the construction fence up until the statue and the uh, flag were up, which was been late, much later than they had planned on for the wall. Ross Perot uh, wanted to withdraw the statue and was threatened to sue him. My delay warrant to later warrant to the pressure died down until all the protests came and went away and built it later. The memorial committee wanted the, uh, wanted the names in the walls there for the original uh, shooting date of Veterans Day 1982. And, they, and up until that, and that time before the permit was done or after the permit, the committee was also afraid that James Watt would pull the per building permit. And the news media just kept flaming the flames of discontent. So finally they found out that one of the panels was ready. So they felt that like the committee said, okay, if we can get one panel there and get it in place, it's going to be hard for them to come back in and stop the project. First, it was they wanted to make sure they got the brown breaking going on to keep the project going. Then they decided to go get a panel. So... As soon as they uh, ordered the panel, and as soon as they found out what the panel was going to be, they tried to get in touch with the names of the families on the panel. They thought they could just go in and look up the names and find the families, but it didn't work that way. But through the uh, Gold Star Mothers, uh, they were able to find three, uh, three families. So on June 22nd, the committee, family members, the parents, veterans who found out about what was going on, and the about a dozen or so, or a couple dozen, uh, news media all met at the wall for the unveiling and the setting of the first panel. Imogene Cup, whose son was buried on his 20th birthday, pulled a rope that dropped a blue velvet curtain away from the wall panel. That panel had 665 names on it. Jan Scruggs introduced the uh, parents and showed where each one of their children or their sons were uh, located in the wall. And each, uh, the family members all got together and went up to the wall and, and placed a single red rose on the panel for their loved ones. But it was something else happened that they noticed there. The family were going up and not just looking at the wall, not just putting the flower there, but they were going up and putting their hand on the wall, touching the wall, loving the wall like it was a living thing. That was a concept they really hadn't come up with before or thought about. So now we got a panel up and we're still moving along. And now they're coming up to short time on their um, due date, which was uh, Veterans Day. So they wanted to get the word out there because they needed more money and they also wanted to help get uh, all the things they needed to do. Getting together, uh, putting together and planning and getting the people in place to do an event like this takes a lot of people, a lot of money, 
in a lot of time. So they called all the major networks and said, this is what we want. Can you make the public announcement so we can get the word out? And any of you who have ever done anything with veterans issues uh, locally can appreciate this because the press said, okay, if you have a good event, then we'll show up. But up until then, don't bother us. We've had tried to get uh, press often uh, over the 28 years, we have read the names of those still missing in action from North Carolina at the Vietnam Memorial downtown Raleigh, and you can't hardly get them there. Uh, but you get someone who's protesting, they're there uh, in, in mass. So that didn't help a whole lot. But they proceeded to start getting parade permits, lining hotels up, uh, getting organization, national organizations involved, getting speakers, writing scripts, getting floats done, and so forth. But the political fight kept right on raising its ugly head. James Watt still wants the memorial dedication delayed until the statue and flag's in place. But the National Veterans Organization, like the American Legion, who had given over a million dollars, they were demanding that the, that the dedication of the memorial be on Veterans Day, November 1982, or not at all. So they had two different groups, or not two different uh, groups, two large different groups, getting together and all wanting different things. They didn't want to come back and, and, de and, and build this as a dedication of memorial because they won't through with the memorial. They were still fighting politics and so forth, uh, but they were trying to get it all done without calling it the dedication, even though that's what they had planned on. Uh, 24 hours before the dedication was supposed to start, they came in, someone called in a bomb threat to add that to all of it, but some uh, uh, national uh, police uh, and uh, bomb squad people who are Vietnam veterans, some of my ex-Green Berets offered to stay guard at the wall for the next 24 hours and so forth. So finally, in 1982, they were ready, and they came. They came from all over the country. Vietnam veterans, families of Vietnam veterans, everybody. One veteran walked 3,000 miles, fully dressed in his combat fatigues, carrying his combat uh, pack, just like he carried in Vietnam. Another couple were having dinner, saw the news that about the dedication of memorial coming up, they cleaned up the dinner table, put the dishes in the uh, dishwasher, and left for Washington. You had uh, another vet that was hitchhiking from the Midwest. I got sleepy, fell asleep. He woke up at an airport with a paid flight pass in his pocket. He didn't have any idea where he came from. A group of veterans checked themselves out of a VA hospital. They didn't have any money whatsoever. They were totally penniless. But a man who had received the Medal of Honor for his actions in Vietnam went and took a personal loan out to, to charter them a bus. They came by motorcycles. They came by bicycle, by foot, cars, buses, airplanes, you name it, car, caravan. They came. They discovered the wall. The Vietnam veterans were proud to be Vietnam veterans again. And they, it kept coming. And right now, today, the Vietnam Memorial is one of the most visited memorials in, in the nation. But as they started coming along when they first started, there were all these letters being written about their loved ones on the wall. And they were coming along and, and doing the phenomenon of name rubbings and all these things that were not thought of in the beginning. But one of the big things that they discovered was they were leaving things at the wall, personal things at the wall, teddy bears, old boots, medals, anything you can think of and then some were, left, were being left at the wall. Lo letters or things that show love, friendship, comradeship, sometimes guilt, every emotion you can think of was illustrated, and each item told its story. Now, the only person who may know the story behind that item may have been the person who left it, 
and the person whose name was on the wall. Because some of them were too deep to, for just everybody to look at and go, oh, yeah, that's what they meant. Now, in the beginning, they didn't know what to do with all that stuff. What are they going to do with all these things that are left? Well, they finally decided to put them in a warehouse facilities. So they came up with a warehouse to put things and just kind of put in there right off to start with uh, a little bit of everything, motorcycles, harmonicas, uh, sea rations, you name it, it was, they were put there. But as they, the story is complicated, just what these stories tell. As, as I'm showing here, one of, the, one of the things that came up left was, was this car with a note. Left for our beloved only son, dead at age 18. They bought him a car, a coffee cup, and his picture left at the wall. Well, the Park Service started having problems with the doing. What they started doing was picking up about hourly, depending on the weather, sometimes more often, these items and storing it in their facilities. Then the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund and uh, the Park Service came up with a uh, warehouse, or as they call it, Museum Resource Center uh, in Maryland, and they started taking things over there. And thank goodness, a, a special gentleman came along, a man by the name of Jerry Felton. He came in and, and was going to help temporarily and get things organized and so forth. And 25 years later, he was still there. Uh, Dewey was a decorated Vietnam veteran, wounded uh, quite badly. But he got the memorial, st uh, the facility started. And when they moved it to this beautiful facility as they have now, uh, he just lovingly came in. Uh, it just He's retired now, but just he's still there with his family. He walks in. Everybody there loves him, appreciate him being there. And the man is absolute treasure trove of information about the items left at the wall and their stories. As things come in, they handle them with gloves. They keep them for 30 days to make sure that there's no organic matter with them because food products and flowers and so forth have to be disposed of because it could ruin the whole uh, displays and so forth. Uh, each thing is they're picked up at the wall or categorized by the panel they're with. And then when they go to the warehouse, they are filed, cataloged with information about them, uh, what they are and so forth. And it's, it's quite a facility to go to and uh, as you flip over, you'll see Dewey with some of the panels and so forth. Uh, he's quite, quite a gentleman. He was just uh, given an award by uh, Congress, special uh, award. Uh, that's Dewey uh, there uh, with some of the panels and displays and so forth. As we come down to the last slide, I got that Dewey there. Let's see. Whoop, okay, keep going. There you go. That's Dewey in, in, the, in the warehouse. Look at those floors. It's... It's unbelievable a warehouse like that is clean and there's no dust all over things. I just don't quite know how they do it. It must have some great filters and so forth. But our last slide here goes right back to Robert McNamara's book. This is the ashes of the copy of his memoir, In Retrospect, by Robert McNamara, who was Defense Secretary from 1961-68. As you can see, this was another Vietnam veteran's idea of just how he felt of Robert McNamara in his book. Now, the second part of this show, which will be the next show, we'll be showing you uh, North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated got together with some of the, uh, some of the men and uh, from the group and decided to go up to see this warehouse. We all heard about it. Uh, plus, we had left something there that was very special, and we want to go see that. So the next show will be our journey back to or to the wall and also to the time that we uh, went to see the things left at the wall. Thank you for tuning in tonight's show and look forward to having you join us next show and which will be the last Wednesday of the month. And we have a comment, I believe, coming in real quick. Hello? Yes. Is, is this Anna? Oh, hello, Bill. Yes, ma'am. Bonnie? 
This is Bonnie. I just, I, I had worked at the wall, and I had never realized the history. And I appreciate what you've done tonight. Well, I appreciate that. And the most I was, you know, Vietnam vet, I knew there was a lot of problems going on, but I did not have any conception of all the problems, backlogs, and so forth they had. It was unbelievable. Uh, Jan Scruggs was never really high on my uh, on my list of people, but I tell you what, I have a whole new respect for the man. It's a good thing he was too dumb to know he couldn't do it. That's right. That's right. Because he didn't have any knowledge what to do, and the man got out there and just wouldn't give up, wouldn't give up, and kept fighting, uh, kept grinning and bearing it, and kept going. Uh, it, it's a phenomenal story, and uh, I'm glad I was able to tell it. Well, as well as Maya Lynn, you know, sticking to her guns. Uh, yes. Uh, it would have been a totally different situation had she not stuck to her guns. She got almost every, almost everything that she wanted. She did agree finally to the inscription uh, that are on the 59, 1959 panel as well as the 1973 panel or 1975 panel. Uh, but other than that, uh, as you know now, the uh, the flag was not put there, and the statue was put uh, where it is now, and it all fits into the triangle uh, along with the Women's Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It all comes together to salute the American soldier, especially those who fought in Vietnam, as well as those who died in Vietnam. And it's, it's quite a tribute to uh, getting things done uh, in spite of uh, controversy, if you just stick with it and, and don't give up. That's right, as, as well as all the women yes. who lost their lives. Yes. Well, okay, then, Bill, it was good job. Thank you, ma'am. And I hope to have I hope to have you on the show for, for too long with your symposium. Uh, they keep putting me off and telling me they're going to get it for me, and I'll get it, and I'll guarantee you we will show it. Okay, good. If, if not, we're going to bring the whole panel back together and do it all over again in Anmon Studio. Okay, I'm right. looking forward to it. Okay, right. bye, Thank Bill. you, Bonnie. Good night. And that is a wrap. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCBBI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net. <laughs>